Humanity has become a species almost beyond number. It is said that the Imperium of Man counts its worth in planets, not men. However, it is the men and women of those planets that form the overwhelming numerical majority within the Imperial War Machine, and though they don't have the biology or the equipment of a space marine, they fight just as hard for the Emperor. These untold billions of pretty much unsung heroes are organised into their various regiments, all part of the overarching organisation we shall cover today. This force is the only one truly numerous enough to wage war and hold the line throughout the Imperium, supported with a plethora of vehicles and elite troops alongside its vast numbers of warriors. Though it is most commonly known today as the Imperial Guard, it is the Astra Militarum, and today we explore how this juggernaut of war is both built and deployed. My name is Michael for Tactica Imperialis, and welcome to 40k Stories. In the days of the Great Crusade, though the Astartes led the charge of Imperial conquest, they did not do it alone. Supporting the Legionis Astartes came the Imperialis Auxilia, more commonly known as the Imperial Army. The first regiments were drawn from Terra itself, human armies from the unification wars that the Emperor permitted to continue serving, and those were known as the Old Hundred. Some of these regiments actually made it to the late Great Crusade, though I don't believe any came out of the Horus Heresy in Tat. If you do know, then I'd be interested to find out, but I cannot be sure. Though they were mainly intended as garrison forces for the various conquered worlds, all raised by the planets themselves, the army became a vast force in its own right, even including its own navy, the Imperialis Armada. They were involved in many campaigns, both alongside the Space Marines and especially alone as the Crusade ground on and their overall field commanders were known as Lord Generals Militant, who were usually distributed at one per sector. Its officers were, however, subservient to the Astartes command structure, meaning that when the Horus Heresy began and half the legions fell, a huge number of their regiments went with them. Unfortunately for both sides, not every commander even went with the Astartes on either side. Many took it upon themselves to carve out their own little empires in the madness of the Civil War, which would have made it difficult to unify humanity afterwards. In fact, it definitely was more difficult. It took the Imperium centuries. Part of the problem was the fact that the Imperialis Armada was indentured to the Auxilia, meaning that any given army contingent had all the resources it needed to take and hold territory, especially in combination with the fact that the army had always been expected to self-resupply on conquered worlds. As a result, as part of the sweeping reforms implemented across the Imperium post-heresy, such a possibility was mitigated against as far as possible. The Imperialis Auxilia ceased to be, along with the Imperialis Armada, and in their place stood the Imperial Navy and the Astra Militarum. The two forces were now entirely independent of one another. No officer of the Navy could hold sway over those of the Militarum, and vice versa. This meant that a ground force that rebelled would be trapped on their planet, whilst the treacherous fleet would have no ground troops or means of available resupply. The trade-off, presumably, would be a lack of both coordination and speed when deploying to a war zone, but the system has gone unchanged for the past 10 millennia, so it can't be working too badly. Then again, it's the Imperium. Slow is kind of its thing. The new Astra Militarum, no more often as the Imperial Guard, were pretty similar to the Imperial Army if you factor out the naval element. Their vast numbers of infantry are still organised into regiments, with the highest command rank in the field being the Lord Militant. They also hold three seats on the High Lords of Terra, if we're being technical at least. The Departmento Munitorum, the branch of the Administratum dedicated to overseeing the running of the Guard, holds three seats in the Senatorum Imperialis. The Lord Commander Militant of the Guard, the Master of the Administratum themselves, and the Chancellor of the Estate Imperium that seems to function as the primary Imperial record keepers. On a smaller scale, regiments actually have a measure of autonomy, allowing for a great amount of diversity in Astra Militarum armies. There are a large amount of subdivisions present too. We don't know huge amounts about most of them, some of them like the Militarum Vendorum we can only speculate about, but they are there, and they keep the largest war machine in the galaxy running at least slightly smoothly. Truthfully though, I don't think anyone can truly appreciate the scale of the Astra Militarum. The recruitment rate and the death toll are probably millions per day, and the actual number of serving warriors is likely untold billions, trillions more. Even the Munitorum can't keep count, perhaps it was never even able to try. This perhaps though is no surprise, you have worlds like Krieg where almost every citizen, if not all of them, are soldiers, or you have worlds like Katachan where a census is practically impossible to take, so not knowing the number of guardsmen in service is 
probably kind of forgivable. Remember what I said at the beginning of this log. As far as we're told, the Imperium counts its lives in planets, not men. The primary fighting unit of the Astra Militarum is known as a regiment, raised all in one go from a single planet. They are in fact temporary formations that, as a rule, do not receive reinforcement from home. As it happens, joining the Guard is practically always a one-way ticket away from home, as your deployment can take you pretty much all but anywhere. This usually means that the continued survival of a regiment is done via off-world recruiting whilst on garrison duty, by fusing with another home regiment that happens to be on the same campaign, or being integrated with an off-world regiment to create a hybrid that, sometimes at least, benefits both. Since trying to cover the structure of an Imperial Guard regiment is a bit of a nightmare given the lack of uniformity across the organisation, it's probably better to up the scale and look at the whole show, how it's run, via the Departmento Munitorum. Formed out of the core Logisticae sometime before the Triumph of Tullanor, the Munitorum has strict organisational tiers that allow for a response to an invasion to be coordinated. The lowest level is planetary, though it has a radius of influence, that's my own term for it, that still stretches across several worlds. If a threat arises, regiments within this radius can be called in to assist. If this is sufficient to contain the problem or otherwise deal with it, the upper echelons of the Munitorum never even get involved. Should it be deemed that it's not enough, however, the next tier of the Munitorum can be called in, known as Subsector Command. As the name implies, this doesn't drag the entire sector into the war just yet, but the radius of influence widens, allowing for more resources to be committed. These tiers are all autonomous, by the by, so again, the higher ranks of the department don't even know what's going on at this point, because it's not a big enough issue. Though I don't have exact figures or percentages, sometimes even the efforts of the subsector are not enough, and so there is this sector command. Again, this widens the sphere of influence around the affected world or system, allowing even more regiments to be chucked into the war effort. But of course, the Astartes are beyond the remit of the Munitorum, as they still do not answer to, at least in some cases, anyone but themselves. The process of passing up the chain isn't actually organic, there's no human error involved. There are predetermined threat levels that dictate the correct course of action, which reduces any bias or human error generally from the equation. Whilst it's not a terrible system, it has one horrible, perhaps even fatal flaw. Inefficiency. The process is horrendously slow, especially factoring in the general bureaucracy across the Imperium. It can take decades for a response to be mustered at sector command level, leaving the world to fall before the cavalry can even be called in to bail them out. When said response is finally mustered, however, huge numbers of regiments are sent into the war zone. Regiments all have their own commanders, who of course have incredibly varied styles of command, but for the largest combined forces, the Munitorum will appoint an overall leader of the guard forces that are collectively known as a battle group. Said leader and their command staff are appointed specifically for this job, so I somehow suspect that the General of the Hour doesn't necessarily keep their own staff in their entirety, especially if specialist advisors from the Navy or whatever need to be attached. They're also universally what you might call backseat generals, always commanding in relative safety as a coordinator rather than getting stuck in on the front lines. It's way too dangerous. Whatever the case, within the regimental structure lies much more, including the various intelligence and strategic corps necessary to allow a war to be prosecuted. Regiment, by the way, is also a catch-all term. It's not just the horde of guardsmen infantry thing. Each regiment is relatively specialised in terms of composition. Each can be classed as a form of infantry, such as light, heavy, regular or mechanised, along with armoured, artillery and siege regiments for the tank or vehicle dominated elements. This, I assume, was again to prevent a single regiment having access to everything it needed were it to rebel, since that logic is what saw the army and navy split as well. But as I don't know the construction of an old army regiment and whether that was all about tanks in one place, infantry in another, I cannot guarantee it. Attached to every regiment are also external elements, such as the tech priests of the Mechanicus, priests of the Ministorum, or of course, the infamous Commissars. So they're not considered official parts of the regimental command, they will serve as liaisons and advisors to the regiment or company commanders, and undoubtedly the amount attached will vary as well. We've covered the Mechanicus and Ministorum elsewhere, but now seems a good time to briefly discuss the Commissariat. Officially known as the Officio Prefectus, they recruit from within the Ministorum-run Scola Progenium, 
ensuring all commissars are both devoted to the emperor and able to keep even the most unruly regiment in line. Well, 99% of the time, I think there's, a, there's one group that have a slight issue with the commissars. The commissars also have authority over the regiment to an extent, able to execute with impunity any who fall short of their uncompromising standards. In fact, it's their sworn duty to do so, from conscripted guardsmen right up to and including the regimental commander. You fail, bang, bolt pistol. In rare cases, most recently with the legendary Ibram Gaunt, commissars can even become commanders, but it's almost unheard of. It can lead to a conflict of interest for the commissar, and so they don't really like it, because how are you supposed to oversee the health and sanity of a regiment when you're also leading that regiment and not an external observer? Makes sense in a way. Interestingly, the officio perfectus is not a standalone department within the Munitorum, as you might expect. Instead, it is formally part of the Militarum Tempestus. In fact, those commissars who fall short in training sometimes join Tempestus squads instead. The Tempestus is also entirely recruited from the Scola Progenium, and are trained to be the finest warriors in the entire Astra Militarum, yet still well steeped in imperial law and creed. They're also borderline indoctrinated, with harsh, mind-breaking regimens being common, but those who survive and come out the other side are as near to perfect soldiers as I suspect humans can get. Kitted out with the finest war gear available, the Tempestus Scions, commonly known as Stormtroopers, are always sent in for the most dangerous or critical operations, with the perhaps understandably jealous guardsmen, or at least jealous of their weapons, nicknaming them as the Glory Boys on more than a few occasions. If scions are not completely broken and are capable of emotion, etc., they may well have these glory-seeking attitudes, but the words of their fellow soldiers will almost certainly be of no consequence in any event. There's no evidence, at least as far as I know, however, that the commissars undergo the same regiments as the stormtroopers. Whatever they go through, though, it makes them one of the most feared sets of individuals in the Astra Militarum, and for those who don't know the Inquisition, perhaps the entire Imperium. Though the true number of regiments is too vast to count, certain ones within the Astra Militarum have won a great deal of renown. We'll not be discussing them here, however, as each of them is worthy of a log in themselves. More on that later. But there are a few reputable but not as well documented ones that I can cover now. Especially, I wish to draw attention to the 13th Penal Legion, the legendary, or perhaps infamous, Last Chances. Penal legions are regiments formed of convicts and criminals, guilty of crimes as severe as murder or desertion, or as simple as not returning a library book or bearing a form of mutation. They are the truest definition of expendable on many occasions, though in extremely rare cases, individuals can actually be redeemed, pardoned, and join the regular guard. But the last chances, well, they're different again. These guys are the worst of the worst, formed and given one last chance at redemption under the command of Colonel Schaefer of the Commissariat. Admittedly, most choose execution rather than join up, such as the 13th's reputation. They're held under heavy guard when in transit and kept in an almost perpetual state of readiness to be deployed from mission to mission. Said missions are entirely suicidal in nature, pretty much impossible to complete, though incredibly diverse. The last chances have been deployed on raids and assassinations, as well as holding untenable breaches and much, much more. As you might expect, the survival rate for these missions is ludicrously low. But if a last chancer can survive an unspecified number, yeah, they don't even tell you how many you've got to get through, they'll actually be pardoned by the colonel, alongside those who die who are pardoned posthumously. Despite these death tolls, however, the now ancient Schaefer and his penal legionaries have never failed, no matter the odds. These missions include the assassination of the Tau Commander Brightsword, though which one I don't know since it's a title that's taken and there's still one today, and the most recent mission took them to Armageddon. The target? The infamous Hermann von Straub, an incompetent commander in the Second War who allied with the Orcs in the Third one. The mission sadly went to hell after the possession of one of the senior members, Lieutenant Cage, who'd actually received a pardon, then got arrested and put into the last chances again. Oops. Uh, he was a latent psyker, but a useful commander, who then defected following his possession. The last chances still took down von Straub, though, as supposedly Cage overcame the demon within him to an extent, don't ask, and hurled both himself and the traitorous von Straub into a lava-filled crevice. Again, don't ask, just some serious willpower, I assume. The fate of the last chances as a group following Armageddon is actually unknown, but if Schaefer survived, the 13th Penal Legion will be back at strength and back at it before too long. Another well-known group of Pina legions are known as the Savlar Chemdogs. 
Taken from the prison world of Savla, these prisoners are amongst the worst the Imperium has got. Don't quite know if the Savlars often go into the last chances, I, I haven't seen statistics. Why do they fight then? With the Empire that imprisoned them, and they're the worst of it, the, seriously, why? Well, the first is obviously the explosive collars that are common amongst penal legions, but the chemdogs are also bribed into battle by being allowed to keep whatever they can loot. Combine this with the chance to get away from Savlar itself and its toxic environment, and you start to see why they might actually go for it. Perhaps because of the conditions of their home world, the Kendals excel in cramped and or toxic conditions, and although their equipment was supposed to be standard issue, they have acquired much more gear from the battlefield for them. Most famously, the Savlar 14th were again on Armageddon in the Third War, with equipment ranging from modified Steel Legion rebreathers to Archaeotech and much more. Finally for now, we have the legendary regiment of Tanith, the only one raised from that forest world in fact. As the first three Tanith regiments were raised in the Sabbat World's Crusade, a Chaos fleet slipped into the system and launched an invasion, and the overseeing Colonel Commissar Ibram Gaunt, who we mentioned earlier, decided that the world could not be saved. As a result, the new troops were evacuated rather than thrown away into a meat grinder, and the survivors were combined into a single regiment known as the Tanith First and Only. A primarily light infantry regiment, the first and only proved skilled at scouting, stealth and reconnaissance, to the point that they were nicknamed Gaunt's Ghosts and quickly run the respect of both their commanding officer and the regiments around them. They were unfortunately whittled down by attrition, but were able to recruit from a world they helped save and eventually integrate the new recruits. And following the disappearance and then return of Gaunt on Garion, they integrated and absorbed the 81st Belladon Regiment as well. Gaunt's ghosts even served as the honour guard and protectors for the remains of St. Savat on Hagia, and when the saint supposedly reincarnated, it was the first and only who were at her side. Eventually, the remaining men of Tanith and their integrated fellows were stationed on garrison duty, as Gaunt felt they'd spent too long on the front lines. What they did following the end of this two-year grace period, I sadly do not know. But while Gaunt still breathes and the ghosts still stand, the first and only will continue to honour the world they lost as they wage war across the galaxy. So end the tales of the Astra Militarum, at least for the moment. The men and women who serve in the Imperial Guard may not be the finest or the bravest warriors in the Imperium, but their numbers, their will, and their equipment are still the primary bulwark for humanity. Diverse as they are, their regiments are all worthy of mention for their actions, including those listed today. There are of course many, many more, too many to count, but there's a plan for that. Starting next time, ladies, gentlemen, and Xenos of all ages, we'll be starting a new mini-series I've decided to term Regiments of Renown. We'll look at a few notable groups within the Astra Militarum, similar to how we looked at the Death Corps of Krieg a while ago. To start us off, I wish to take a break from the subtleties and the maddening confusion of the Harlequins and the Warp and Gene Stealer cults and all our other recent adventures. I want to go somewhere nice and organised. How does that sound? Somewhere organised. For now though, it is time to end. Thank you very much for watching. My name is Michael for Tactica Imperialis, and I'll see you all again. Goodbye.